Good day. Over the last couple of days, I've been focused mainly in my discussions about the conflict in Ukraine, on the fighting in Bakhmut, and it's clear to me that this is still very much, in fact, perhaps even more so than before, the principal, the key battle going on at the moment in the Ukraine war. But a couple of days ago, I also said that there's some information coming through that Ukraine was finally starting to pull its back troops out of Bakhmut, that it was starting to recognise that the fight for Bakhmut is now um, irretrievably lost, and that the best thing to do is to pull the men out whilst it's still possible to do so. Well, I'm afraid I was premature. I'm going to say it straightforwardly. The wish, in my case, was perhaps the father to the thought, because over the last couple of hours, it looks as if the opposite is happening, and that instead of pulling troops out of Bakhmut, Ukraine is doing the opposite. It is again trying to reinforce its positions there, not just in Bakhmut itself, but in other places, in the other villages and uh, small towns in and around Bakhmut, which are now the scene of this enormous battle. Well, before I do that, I'll just, I think, catch up on a few events, uh, 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 a few of the actual events around Bakhmut. The epicentre of the fighting, the, the place where the most intense fighting is now going on, is this village of Paraskovievka. And um, yesterday, I said that I was a bit sceptical that one and a half thousand Ukrainian troops could indeed be located there. But I've since had a cascade of claims and reports from all sorts of sources, including private ones sent to me by email, that in fact, there are indeed that many Ukrainian troops in Paraskovievka, or in the areas immediately adjacent to it, and that some of these are troops who were evacuated from Solidar, they pulled back to Paraskovievka, and that's why they're there now. But there's also been reports that Ukraine has now um, redirected, sent um, several hundred more men, apparently at least a battalion, perhaps more worth of troops to Paraskovievka and those areas, and that it's also redeployed some tanks to this area as well. And the purpose of doing this is to try to slow the closing of the Russian pincers. Now, the Russians are pushing both from the north and from the south, um, the point where these two pincers are apparently intended to link up, it's clear to me, is now Chasov Yar, this town to the west of Bakhmut. The Russians are deploying massive amounts of, our, of artillery in the area, and it seems that this is the objective, this is the Russian objective. It is to create a cauldron around Bakhmut, and much of the Ukrainian grouping, which is stationed both in Bakhmut itself and around it, by gradually pushing these pincers closed, by trapping them all, um, by reaching both from the south and from the north, Chas of Yar. And I understand that Russian troops, Wagner assault force troops, have indeed reached the outskirts of Chasov Yar from the south, and there's ongoing fighting going on there. But the major push now is coming from the north, and it's this northern advance through Paraskovievka that the Ukrainians are trying to stop. And that's why they are sending reinforcements, or so it seems to me, to Paraskovievka, to other parts of Bakhmut. They're trying to still despite everything, despite the accumulating losses, which, well, I've discussed many reports in the past about how Ukrainian soldiers describe the fighting in Bakhmut and in the area, areas around it as 
utterly hellish. Well, despite all of that, Ukraine continues to reinforce in Bakhmut. Now, that's the military side of things. The fact that Ukraine increasingly looks like it's recognising that at some point Bakhmut itself is going to fall is shown by other steps that Ukraine is simultaneously taking. I spoke a few days ago about how Ukraine has now barred journalists from visiting Bakhmut, something which it also did, by the way, shortly before the collapse in Soledad. But um, there was also reports some days ago that the Ukrainian authorities have relocated a lot of the documentation, the archives that were held in the various municipal buildings in Bakhmut. They've take them, taken them away. They've evacuated them, um, probably some of the civil service workers. By the way, this is not something to be entirely discounted in terms of its importance, because Bakhmut, as I've said previously, was to a great extent the hub of Ukrainian defences in this part of uh, Donbass. So it's highly likely that a lot of that documentation that's been taken out of Bakhmut, if it were ever to fall into Russian hands, would be of great interest to the Russians. They might be able to recreate some of the Ukrainian movements and perhaps obtain an insight into some of the discussions that took place in Bakhmut, which were presumably minuted, including discussions which have involved President Zelensky himself. So, you know, one can understand why the Ukrainians would be anxious to take all this material away. Anyway, that's what the Ukrainians did. And earlier today, there was a further announcement from the Ukrainian authorities that they're telling all the remaining civilians in Bakhmut, around 6,000 of them, by Ukrainian government estimates, to leave the town at once. Now, all of that taken together strongly suggests that one branch of the Ukrainian government expects Bakhmut to fall. However, the other branch, the other side, are determined to hold on in Bakhmut and to go on doing so until, well, I'm not sure what exact outcome Ukraine expects. Zelensky has talked about holding out in Bakhmut until Ukraine is able to go back on the attack. Um, most people expect that that would happen if it happens at all, uh, that that will happen in the late spring or summer at the earliest. One wonders whether Ukraine has anything like, the, anything like that sort of time window to reverse the flow of events in Bakhmut. And Ukraine's very hardline foreign minister, Mr. Kuleba, has come out and said that it makes no sense for Ukraine to abandon Bakhmut, because if it did, well, the next town, presumably he has Kramatorsk in mind, would be would have to experience the same kind of siege. Well, I have to say, the first doesn't seem to me to be an explanation. The second is a rationalisation. Perhaps a wiser thing to do, rather than to throw away lives defending in ba defending Bakhmut, perhaps to th throw away lives defending Kramatorsk, might be to sit down and talk, and at least any way to try to withdraw these troops from these places. But exactly as has happened before, as happened in Mariupol in the summer, and then subsequently in Severodonetsk and Lizichansk and in other places, Ukraine simply refuses to withdraw its troops. It asks them to hold, it tells them to embed themselves. It, as a result, suffers extraordinarily high losses defending undefendable positions. Um, I have never understood the logic of it, but unfortunately, and contrary to what I thought might be happening a few days ago,
it seems that that's what Ukraine is doing again in Bakhmut. And I would point out and remind everybody again that a few weeks ago there were reports from Reuters that the US military is beginning to become, was becoming at that point concerned about the scale of the losses Ukraine was experiencing in Bakhmut and was advising Ukraine to pull back from the town and that the German intelligence agency, the BND, was briefing the Bundestag in the same way it too was saying that Bakhmut couldn't be held, that Ukraine is playing a disproportionate cost trying to defend Bakhmut, and that this is ultimately an unsustainable idea. And the implication was that Ukraine should withdraw from Bakhmut. So Ukraine is getting that kind of advice, even from its own Western allies, that President Zelensky, his foreign minister, Mr. Kuleba, they're disregarding it. They're apparently even refusing to listen to the advice of some of their military commanders, perhaps even General Zeluzhny himself. They're clinging on to Bakhmut, as Zelensky has said, until the bitter end. So I expect the fighting around Bakhmut to continue for a while yet. Eventually, um, Paraskovievka will be captured by the Russians. Of that, I have no doubt. Eventually, the Russians will get to Chasov Yar from the north. Eventually, or so it seems to me, there will be a hall of prisoners, large numbers of prisoners in Bakhmut. And the Ukrainians will no doubt rationalize it as they've done previously in battles for. Mariupol, Popaznaya, Severodonetsk, Lizichansk, and such places, they say it was all worthwhile because Ukraine has gained time. Well, we're going to talk about that in a moment, but let me focus first on what's going on in another part of the front line, and this is Kremenaya, Svatovo, um, Kupiansk. There's been a lot of fighting around here again, and again, it looks as if the Ukrainians are trying to reinforce their rushing troops to this, to hold this particular part of the front line, even as they're mobilizing feverishly, trying to conscript as many men as possible in Ukraine itself. Well, I've just seen a report on from TASS. This is from our old friend, um, retired Lieutenant Colonel Marochko of the Lugansk militia, that in the Kremenaya area, Ukraine is losing around 200 men a day, dead and presumably wounded. And Marochko says, he may be right, he may not be, but he says that Ukraine's losses in this part of the front line is now are now at the same level, approximately, as those in Bakhmut itself. So if we follow that logic, the logic of what uh, Lieutenant Colonel Marochko is saying, um, the area of Kremenaya, Svatovo, Liman, Kupiansk is turning for Ukraine into another meat grinder, rather like Bakhmut itself is. Now, of course, what Marochko didn't discuss are Russian losses. He doesn't give any figures for the losses that the Russians are undoubtedly experiencing in all of these battles. But um, as chance would have it, the BBC has now provided an update of its reports, um, of, its, um, of, of the reports that it does with Medusa, this Russian website based in Latvia. They've been um, scanning open um, sources, checking cemeteries and death, death records and those kind of things. And they've now come up for a total of 14,000 Russians, Russian soldiers killed in the fighting in Ukraine since the start of the conflict since the start of the conflict last February, 
up to the 12th of February of this year. 14,000 killed. Now, I've in the past um, wondered to what extent this is, you know, the global figure. The BBC in the past, though, obviously, interestingly enough, not in this latest report, has said that this is should be treated as an absolute minimum baseline figure and that the total is perhaps between 40 and 60 percent higher, which would take us up to around 20,000. And I've sort of accepted that. I've also wondered whether these numbers include other forces like the Wagner Organization um, fighters and the Chechen forces. Now, on the second, I have to say, I had previously thought to myself that, well, perhaps they didn't. But I, I've now started to rethink this, and I think that these numbers that the BBC and Medusa are giving probably do. After all, presumably, any Wagner um, assault troops or Chechen troops who are killed and who are buried on Russian territory would have been identified as having been killed in the course of the fighting. So, why would the BBC and Medusa not be looking out for these dead Chechen and Wagner soldiers? I presume that they are. In which case, it seems to me that 14,000 um, might, in fact, this, this figure of 14,000 might actually cover the totality of Russian forces, um, regular army, Wagner and Chechen, that have been deployed to Ukraine and have participated in this war, um, excluding the Donbass militia. But we do, by the way, have casualty numbers for the Donbass militia. And though those are not entirely easy to assess, um, I get the sense that, again, these are probably add perhaps another couple of thousand onto this total. And anyway, one way or another, we're unlikely to get much more than these figures that the BBC is that the BBC is providing. Now, I will say this: these figures that the BBC and Medusa are providing, if they do include Chechen and Wagner assault troops, which I suspect they do, then they will match almost exactly the line of casualties that have been provided, or these are dead Russian dead uh, soldiers killed in the fighting, regular Russian soldiers killed in the fighting, that has been provided by the Ministry of Defence. I say matched exactly. I, that's wrong, actually, because we're still talking about estimates. The Russians only occasionally publish figures for the numbers of their troops who have been killed. You have to make certain kinds of extrapolations. But if you do that, if you accept a sort of linear line along the basis of, you know, the figures that the Russian Ministry of Defense announces and assume that these figures from BBC and Medusa include Wagner and Chechen troops, then you would probably find that the total number of Russians have been Russian regular soldiers who've been killed is very close to what the most reasonable guesstimates of what Russian numbers of dead Russian soldiers would be if you accept Russian Ministry of Defense figures. And that, by the way, rather argues against the theory that there are large numbers of other uh, large numbers of Russian soldiers who've been killed 
who the BBC and Medusa are not finding. The BBC and Medusa said that, you know, probably r true Russian casualty levels are 40 to 60 percent higher than the numbers that they're citing. But it's important to say that the numbers they are citing are those of confirmed deaths. Any additional deaths are inferred or speculative. They're not actual, real, concrete deaths which have been identified and counted. And it may be that the reason they're not being identified and counted is because they are not there, they're not present in anything like the, num the figures that the BBC and Medusa imagine. Now, again, I'm, I'm quite open about this. This is a little bit of my own reading of these figures, and it may be that I'm wrong. If the BBC is not counting Wagner assault troops and Chechens, well, I think they should make that clear. <laughs> and until they do, <laughs> I will assume that they are. Now, whatever we're talking about, whatever figures we're talking about here, even if you take the very highest estimates based on these figures and push them up to 20 or 30,000, they don't come anywhere close to the hundreds of thousands that you see being cited by the Ukrainians themselves, repeated by the US and by all sorts of other um, people in the West, commentators in the West. And if it's as low as 14,000, which would correlate, as I said, very closely with the Russian Ministry of Defence's numbers, then numbers of Russian deaths are being hugely, catastrophically overestimated. Now, I'm going to say something else. Um, every day, almost, I see videos, pictures of Ukrainian cemeteries with Ukrainian flags. They give the impression of hundreds, thousands of bodies buried in these places. It, they're some of the most distressing pictures that are coming out of the war. And of course, I've also seen, and these are even more distressing, I don't search them out, but sometimes I stumble across them, pictures of large numbers of Ukrainian soldiers on the battlefields. I haven't seen anything analogous in Russia. And I also have to say this, if numbers of dead in Russia were on anything like the scale that has sometimes been claimed, then I would ex expect the fact to have filtered its way through in a large way into Russian social media, which is, by the way, vibrant and active as it has always been, and into Russian newspapers. Bear in mind, the BBC, with its enormous resources and Medusa, are probably going out tracking all reports on social media, Russian social media, in Russian newspapers, trying to keep a track of how many dead Russians there are. So, I have to say this. It's probably the case going back to what Marochka was saying, that the Russians have suffered losses as well. If it's undisputably the case, that the Russians have suffered losses in the Svatovo, Kremenaya, uh, Kupiansk, Kliman area. And it's definitely the case that the Russians have suffered losses in Bakhmut and in other places like Vul Vuglada and in Makayevka, where there was that high mass missile strike few weeks ago. I'll come to that in a moment. But the BBC's figures suggest that these are far lower than what we are seeing coming out of Ukraine. And that correlates 
very closely with the way in which the Russians are talking about grinding the Ukrainians down. That's exactly what they're doing. They're waging an attrition war based heavily on artillery and on incremental infantry advances. And it appears to be succeeding. And the reliable figures for Russian casualties, not the, not the speculative ones, not the guesswork ones, but the actual concrete numbers as, comparis as compared with what we've been seeing coming out of Ukraine in terms of social media, pictures of dead soldiers on the battlefronts, pictures of flags in cemeteries, um, occasional admissions from people like the BND in their report of the Bundestag, they suggest that Ukrainian losses are extremely heavy. So this is, this is how it seems to me, tells us a lot about what is actually going on on these battlefronts. And of course, once the Russians compete, complete the envelopment of Bakhmut, which they will, Ukraine is going to suffer even more losses there. They're going to lose more men, more machines. Many men will be captured. Many more men will be killed. Some of them will be wounded, perhaps wounded and scarred for life. And in the meantime, as I said, the Russians are able to absorb their losses and press on. If you want to pursue historical analogies, why not look at what happened in 1864 during the American Civil War when the Union forces under General Grant in the Wilderness Campaign bled the Confederacy dry. There wasn't a huge amount of movement on the battle lines, but eventually the attrition exhausted the Confederacy. And that seems to me to be, in a modern context, very different today, obviously, we'll come to that in a moment, in a modern context, what the Russians are doing in Ukraine now, and it's working. Now, there's a few further things uh, to be said here. There's also apparently been fighting going on in Vugledar. Far less information about this. Fighting going on in and around Marinka, near Donetsk City. Again, one gets the sense that Ukraine is rushing reinforcements to these places. It's continuing to fight this sort of attrition war, which is what the Russians wanted to do. Now, this now brings me to a number of rather interesting um, articles which have appeared. The first is by a gentleman who I know absolutely nothing of. He's um, never been somebody I've <laughs> had any... Um, I've had any, you know, dealings with or been informed about before, who uh, writes under the name of Simplic Simplicius the Thinker. And um, he's written a huge substack piece about um, why the war in Ukraine is being fought as it is. And can I acknowledge, first of all, that I've only learned of this article because Jeff Roberts, the historian, has circulated details of this um, article um, in a, um, a circular email that he regularly sends to people in which he provides links to various interesting articles that he Finds. And this is a very interesting article, even though I won't pretend that I understand all of its technical aspects. But anyway, the essential points that Simplicius the thinker, if I can call him that, basically is saying is that in the modern battlefield, the kind of battlefield that we have today, um, it really isn't possible to try to uh, undertake complex manoeuvre warfare because... Um, there are so many um, 
eyes in the sky now, so many drones, so many satellites, so many means of keeping every movement under observation, that complex manoeuvre warfare can be detected immediately by the other side and can immediately experience a strong counter reaction, counter response. So that, you know, the days when, you know, you could send tank column or creep up quietly to an enemy, catch them by surprise, all of that basically is gone. And Simplicius the thinker comes up with ways and means whereby the Russians, because it's, he's talking mostly about the Russians going on the offensive, might be able to counter this kind of way of conducting uh, 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 this reality of war. And he discusses all sorts of possibilities. He discusses how the Russians, for example, might decide to knock out uh, US satellites. Well, they might do that. that. We might come to that at some point. They certainly possess the means to do it. That would be an enormous escalatory move. And my impression is that the Russians aren't thinking in that way. And he also talks about tactics. He says that, you know, you can sh send small numbers of troops into battle and they're not less notable than the large, heavy, armoured fists that we used to see in the past. And I've discussed in the past how the Ukrainians seem to attack in penny packets. And it's suggested that this is partly the reason that it's to sort of deflect attention away from the eyes in the sky that both sides have from the surveillance, enormously advanced surveillance equipment that both sides have been able to deploy to the battle. But overall, Simplicius the thinker suggests that the most practical way for the Russians to deal with these problems is twofold. One is to attack simultaneously along multiple fronts, which could create for Ukraine some kind of systems overload and which would result in even the Ukrainians being over overwhelmed by the number of simultaneous advances that are taking place from multiple directions. And we're actually seeing something like that actually happen. We see the big Russian advance around Bakhmut. It's been carried out steadily, incrementally, but it's, you know, the big advance. But at the same time, we're seeing Russian push, Russian attacks in Bozaporozhye a few weeks ago, in the Vugledar area, um, in Svatovo Kremenaya, as I've just discussed. All of that's going on um, at the same time. And there are now... There's now an interesting report in the London Times that there's a major Russian build-up um, opposite the Ukrainian town of Sumy, which is in the north of Ukraine, near the Russian border. There's said to be 10,000 Russian troops close to Sumy, and the Ukrainians who are located there apparently are worried that there might be a Russian offensive launched towards Sumi from the north. So you could see this idea that Simplicius the thinker is talking about the Russia advancing from all directions simultaneously, overwhelming Ukrainian defences, that that might be part of what the Russians might decide to do. Very complex, very risky in my opinion. But anyway, possibly that is part of the Russian plan. And the other way of doing this is to do exactly what the Russians are doing now, which is to advance steadily, slowly, incrementally, step by step, with massive artillery barrages, knocking out Ukraine's artillery, knocking out Ukrainian defences, um, grinding down Ukrainian forces, um, showing, uh, avoiding big arrow offensives because they know that such big arrow offensives are difficult to pull off in today's 
battlefields, conserving men, avoiding heavy losses, saving machines, and that this explains why the Russians are waging the war in the way that they are. And Simplicius the thinker appears to think that this is the correct way to wage this war and that it's working out as the Russians intended to. And he may very well be right. But what makes this very interesting indeed is that we see on the other side of the hill the West is advising Ukraine to do things entirely differently. Where the Russians are advancing slowly, methodically, incrementally, relying on massive artillery barrages to achieve their advances, grinding the Ukrainians down, building fortifications where they need to, to protect their rear areas. Um, the Western powers, and we're getting this now, we're getting lots of articles about this, but we've also had suggestions that they should do this from no less than Generals Austin and Milley at a press conference, the joint press conference that they recently gave. There's the suggestions that what the Ukrainians should do is that they should not rely so much on artillery. They should not engage in large artillery strikes, try to counter Russian artillery barrages. They should instead seek to fight in a more supposedly Western way, engage in a more mobile form of war, uh, rely more on armoured vehicles and try to counter the Russians in that kind of fashion. Now, Brian Boletic has done a truly outstanding video, again, discussing this, and he makes the point, it's an entirely valid point, that what Austin and Milley and all of these other articles are essentially saying is that the West has given up any idea that it can match Russia in artillery and in artillery ammunition. And this has been a topic um, I've discussed to the point of exhaustion, and I've no doubt that Ron Boletic is right. And in fact, a couple of weeks ago, when we first saw this story in um, Reuters, that the West was giving Ukraine this advice to try and conserve artillery usage. Well, even then, at that point, I said that what that essentially meant was that the Western powers have gradually come to accept that Ukraine has lost the artillery war and that the West has lost the artillery war, that there is absolutely no way that the Western powers can match the Russians gun for gun and gun for, uh, and shell for shell. And that's essentially what they're telling the Ukrainians. But let's take a step back and think about what Simplicius, the, the thinker, is telling us. What he's saying is that on the modern battlefield, the kind of mobile warfare, you know, the sort of skillful, agile warfare that has been engaged in um, historically, since about the, sec the time of the Second World War, I suppose, is no longer possible because mobile warfare really relies to a very great extent on an ability to keep the enemy on the sort of hop, unaware of exactly what you're doing, where your attack is going to come from, that kind of thing. Whereas today, with all this enormous amount of surveillance that goes on, with the fleets of satellites, which the Russians also have, by the way, and the drones, which the Russians are increasing numbers of, um, that realistically, mobile warfare of that nature is impossible. And if so, if Simplicius, the thinker, is right, then the Western powers are pushing Ukraine into a model of war that ultimately is not going to work for them. And this 
brings me back to what Brian Boletic he said uh, um, said in his video because Brian Boletic made the point that in the Kharkiv and Kherson counteroffensives, the Ukrainians also sought to engage in some kind of mobile operations. Um, they were never able in either battle battlefield to match Russian artillery densities. And though they did, in both cases, gain ground, the casualties they suffered were exceptionally high. They lost brigades worth of men and machines. And that is exactly what Simplicius, the thinker, um, is saying would happen on a modern battlefield if one approached it in that sort of way. And we see that it looks as if the practical experience of Ukraine in Kherson and Kharkiv would be the same. But Brian Baledi makes a further, and I think it's an entirely valid point, there's now a general acceptance, acknowledgement in the West, or at least in the United States, that we're coming now very close to the point where the war, as it is, becomes unsustainable. And perhaps the most coherent statement of why that is so has come from a U.S. senator, influential U.S. senator in some ways, Josh Hawley. Now, Hawley is a, on the right of the Republican Party, what is sometimes called the populist right of the Republican Party. He is somebody that quite a few people, I think, in the United States don't take very kindly to for all kinds of political reasons, good and bad. And I'm going to say that for my part, I find that he has a uh, he's, he has this problem with China, which I think affects his thinking, as it does that of many Americans I know, and with which I personally don't agree. I think that this idea of the United States getting drawn into a conflict with China is a mistake. But that doesn't alter the fact that, he, as I said, he is, I think, starting to articulate many of the points that are probably being made increasingly behind the scenes. And I'm not suggesting that he's um, part of, you know, the internal debate that I've been talking about, the one between the realists and the Pentagon and the hardliners. But perhaps this speech that she's just given, Hawley has just given, gives us a better feel of what is probably being discussed at some level in Washington. And as a US senator, I can't believe that Hawley is entirely uninformed about what is going on. Anyway, um, Hawley makes a number of points. He says, the truth is we are overcommitted. Our elites are deluded by the dream of a liberal empire. The uni party, he means by that the... Democratic Party and the Republican Party establishments tell us that we are on the right side of history and tough trade-offs don't exist. That's just not true. And he goes on to say that uh, we have leaders on both parties, former NATO brass, telling us that defending Ukraine is basically the same thing as deterring China. The truth is that the Uniparty's impossible dreams of democratizing China and US enriching the US economy um, already exposed the weakness of the foreign policy that dominates the DC hive mind. And the Uniparty's way is not sustainable, it's a path to failure. And he then discusses the overinvestment the United States made in its wars in the Middle East. He says that we invested billions of dollars there. 
and lost hundreds and thousands of American lives, all while China rose unimpeded. And the people who are responsible for those misjudgments are still members of the DC, DC establishment in good standing, and nobody has ever been held accountable. Now we're hearing the same siren song again. This time, it's about Ukraine. And he says it's not worked for our deck for decades. It's not working for our security. It's not working for our economy. And he goes on to say that um, the focus of the United States should be on building up its internal strength, not getting distracted by foreign adventures. But then he goes on to say, and this is, I think, the key to a lot of the discussion, I suspect, which is now going on in Washington, the core problem is our actions in Ukraine are directly affecting our ability to deter our most pressing adversary, that is China in the Pacific. And he admits that initially he supported funding for Ukraine, but goes on to say, I had no idea that we were going to fight an endless proxy war and do nation building there, because that's not what we said we're going to do in the beginning. The truth is, we cannot defend Ukraine and stop China in Taiwan and see to our military requirements at the same time. We simply cannot do it all. And frankly, we shouldn't have to. Sending billions more to Ukraine to promote a stable, rule-based international order that appeases the DC establishment that transcends all changing administrations and which is designed to force regime change in Russia is nonsense. Well, that's a US senator talking about things. Now, as I said, he's not mainstream, but if you go back to the 1960s and you see criticisms that started to be made in the mid-1960s about the US commitment to, Ukraine, to, to Vietnam, you find much the same arguments being said, that the United States was becoming overcommitted. It was engaging in all kinds of wars in peripheral areas, peripheral to its interests. It was neglecting its core interests. And it had an exaggerated sense of its own power and its own ability to shape things everywhere. And there's been another very interesting article, this time um, on Sky News of all places, by uh, another person who I must admit I don't have any previous knowledge of, Professor Joseph M. Siracusa who makes very similar points in some respects to Senator Hawley, but also brings again up the issue of Vietnam. And I'm not going to read the Siracusa article, but basically Professor Siracusa says that the United States will abandon the unwinnable proxy war in Ukraine like they ended their failure in Vietnam. And uh, Siracusa talks about how the United States made all kinds of similar um, commitments or apparent commitments to Vietnam. And he makes the point that eventually, despite all those commitments, the United States recognized that it couldn't sustain indefinitely the conflict in Vietnam. It cut a deal with the North Vietnamese and it pulled out. And he predicts that eventually the same thing will happen with the United States in Ukraine. And he also quotes comments made at the time by people like Henry Kissinger and Kissinger's um, admission made at the time that the United States um, cannot, could not be strong everywhere all the time that the United States would have to 
think hard in future about what commitments it made and try to limit its commitments to um, it rather match its commitments to its resources. I've discussed what for me are the strong similarities between this conflict and Vietnam in the past. And here we have an academic, I presume an American academic, Professor Siracusa, making the same parallels. Anyway, there we go, interesting articles. But of course, the hardliners are not finished. We've had some comments from the um, terrible duo, in my opinion, of Secretary Blinken and uh, Assistant Secretary Newland. And Blinken uh, has made public comments in which he's appeared to concede that Ukraine cannot retake Crimea, which is, I'm sure, true. And I think some people have rather unwisely rushed to assume from that that Secretary Blinken is now seriously thinking about peace and about some sort of partition plan. There's been an interesting article in the Irresponsible Statecraft, the website of the Quincy Institute, which uh, stands for what passes for realism in US foreign policy. Anyway, this article also seems to accept that Ukraine is not going to be able to win a clear-cut military victory in, um, on the battlefields in Ukraine, and that Crimea it certainly is beyond its reach. And it says that behind all the windy rhetoric of as long as it takes, the United States is already now thinking about some kind of partition plan. But of course, Blinken isn't really talking about that. Um, we've seen just a few hours later, Victoria Nuland, he's Assistant Secretary of State, he's nominal subordinate, she's come forward and is insisting that you, Crimea must be demilitarized completely by the Russians as part of any peace deal. And I've already explained why that is simply not going to be acceptable to the Russians and that any peace proposal based on that kind of idea is a non-starter and Blinken and Newland surely know it. The reason Blinken and Newland are coming up with these kind of comments is because they want to continue the war and they're making proposals what are supposed to look like peace proposals which are in fact no such thing. They're trying to deflect away from the growing demands from parts of the military, from parts of the more realist sections of the US establishment, from people like Josh Hawley, who are now demanding some kind of peace settlement. They're trying to deflect by coming up with unrealistic and unachievable proposals, which they know Russia will reject in order to keep the war going. But it does in fact seem to be the case that more and more minds, in Washington at least, are coming to the gradual realization that this war is unsustainable it cannot be prolonged indefinitely. It cannot be won. And I suspect, again, mirroring Brian Balletic here, that the ultimate constraint is the one that Senator Hawley is identifying, which is that the United States cannot sustain indefinitely this proxy war in Ukraine without weakening its overall military position and indeed perhaps its geopolitical position. Um, and that for that reason, especially given 
the challenge from China. This conflict must in some way be wound down. And you're hearing now lots of reports also circulating that Ukraine is being told by a variety of US officials that the war has to be brought to an end by the summer in some form because there's no guarantee that US support for Ukraine will continue beyond the summer and that the time window, General Austin actually even said this in that press conference he had with General Milley, that the time window for Ukraine to change the dynamics on the battlefield is closing. Now, <laughs> this is troubling because, of course, what you're seeing from people like Austin, who I think on this issue is very much aligned with the Blinken Newland camp, is that what he's essentially doing is he's pushing Ukraine to do the opposite of what, it seems to me, the uniformed military are advising it to do. The uniformed military are advising Ukraine to conserve resources, whereas um, Austin, together with Blinken and Newland, want Ukraine to try and launch some kind of offensive to try to regain ground, even though, from a military point of view, for all the reasons discussed in this programme, explained in that massive article by Simplicius the Thinker, that makes that's a bad idea in military terms. Well, we'll see what happens, but I fear that Ukraine will probably do that which Austin, Blinken and Newland wanted to do. There's been a rather depressing um, series of comments from Danilov, who is the chief of Ukraine's um, uh, National Defence and Security Council, which in my opinion, I'll say this straightforwardly, I think is the most important institution in Ukraine today. I think it's more important and more powerful than Zelensky himself. Anyway, Danilov says, said that um, the only way this war can end is through the breakup of Russia. That's the only way to secure peace, apparently. But perhaps more importantly, he also said that, yes, Ukraine is again going through very hard times, but the situation will turn in the summer. And by the way, that was exactly what the Ukrainians were saying last summer when they were losing in places like Mariupol and Popoznaya and Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. And we saw that what followed were these offensives in Kharkov region and in Kherson region where Ukraine lost tens of thousands of troops and gained ground, which in Kherson region is of little, well, no strategic value. But anyway, He's now saying that again. He's coming up with this whole mantra all over again. And he's doing this. And we can perhaps start to see some kind of method in Ukraine's approach, because it looks as if Ukraine is now trying to hold the front lines as much as it can, even as the Russian pressure incrementally and steadily increases, even as it suffers more casualties, even as it runs into another meat grinder, this time perhaps in the Kremenaya region, as well as the one in ba Bakhmut. But this is what Danilov wants. And his plan, or his idea, appears to be to integrate all of these soldiers who have been trained in Western-style mobile warfare tactics in the West, <laughs> um, in Germany and Britain, integrate them with these Marder and Bradley infantry fighting vehicles and with these Western tanks. And by the way, the story now is that 
Ukraine is likely to receive over the next few weeks only 18 Leopard 2s, 14 from Germany, 4 from Portugal, all of the other countries that seem to be prepared to promise Leopard 2s, um, Spain, the Netherlands, Denmark, Finland, they all seem to have backed off that idea. Their militaries aren't keen on it. Anyway, eight, all of 18 tanks plus the 14 they're going to get from Britain, nowhere near the number that um, Olaf Scholz was suggesting a few weeks ago. Eventually, of course, they'll get more. They'll get more Leopard 2s. They're apparently of an inferior type from Poland. And they'll get lots and lots of Leopard 1s, which Defence Minister, German Defence Minister Pistorius says should not be underestimated, and perhaps they shouldn't be, but which nonetheless are an old style of tank with thin armour, dangerous, I would have thought, for Ukraine to use. But anyway... This is Danilov's plan. Get those men in the, who have been trained in the West, train them to use these mobile tactics, all in a very, very short couple of weeks, months of time, integrate them with these very complex and difficult machines, these Bradleys and Marders, and then launch them in some kind of offensive in Ukraine, straight into the Russian guns and all the fortifications that the Russians have been building up in various parts of Ukraine. And I was reading, by the way, that um, a couple of days ago, a Ukrainian official claimed that there are now tens of thousands of Russian troops located in the Zaporozhye area, where these big fortifications are located, and of course it was Zaporozhye, which was supposed to be the area where the Ukrainians were going to launch their great offensive to the Sea of Azov. So I think this is all looking very problematic indeed, but it explains perhaps what passes for the strategy. Hold out in places like Bakhmut, bleed away the life of Ukraine, send all these young men and old men to these places to die, and hope that the 30, 40, 50,000 men that you're training in the West, if it is even that number, I'm not sure that it is. I think in Britain it's only 10,000. I don't know how many have been trained in Germany. But anyway, to train them up, get them to use these 100 Bradleys and 40 Martyrs and 18 tanks and perhaps a few more coming in a few weeks' time after that. Train them up to the level that you can. Throw them into battle without the long-range missiles, without the air cover and hope for the best. Well, it's all very dismal <laughs> and I'm one can see why, to someone like self, my, like myself, it frankly doesn't look like a plan. But that, I suspect, is what Ukraine is going to end up doing. And then, perhaps they might recover, gain some, some ground at a hideous cost. Maybe that will lead to a little bit more in weapon systems being provided to Ukraine. But perhaps not. Perhaps at some point in the summer, the supplies will dry up. Not because, I stress again, because there's going to be a lack of money. Despite what Hawley is saying, despite what Marjorie Taylor Greene is saying, despite what Ron Paul and Rand Paul are saying, I still think Congress will vote these funds for Ukraine if it's asked to. The trouble will be that the ammunition stocks, the missile stocks, all of those, they will start to run down. And at that point, the United States might just possibly cut the deal. And of course, what has happened when the United States has cut those deals, as it did with North Vietnam, 
as it did with Afghanistan, is that the country that they abandoned, South Vietnam and Afghanistan, respectively, the leaders of those countries felt let down and betrayed, weren't able to stop the war, tried to carry it on without this huge infusion of American help that they had been getting before. And of course, what that did was, all that did was, it caused the final collapse of their countries. History doesn't always repeat itself, but it sometimes rhymes. Anyway, that's my programme for today. More from me soon. We're seeing what happens in Bakhmut and Kremenia and Vugladar and all of these other places and whether the, where the debate in the West goes. Thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon. And in the meantime, please remember you can find all our videos on all our various platforms, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin and Telegram. You can support our work by Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video. You should remember to check out our shop, get yourself all the great things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, please remember, if you've liked this video, to press the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you again. More from me soon and have a very good day.